have returned to the God of my childhood, to the same simple faith as a child I once knew, like the prodigal son. I longed for my loved ones, for the comforts of home. And the God I outgrew. I have returned to the God of my childhood, Bethlehem Spain, the prophet's Messiah. One of the most wonderful promises that God gives to us in the scriptures is that we're going to spend eternity together with Him. When we think about eternity with God, whether it's the new heaven or the new earth, when we think about these things, we can often imagine how wonderful a place it is. In 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9, we are told, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither had entered into the heart of man the things that God had prepared for them that love Him. What God has prepared for us in our best imagination, it is impossible to be able to describe it. The scriptures attempt it, but in reality, it is no way to describe it. Now, when Jesus left this earth, he gave us a promise that we're going to be with him. In John 14, 1 to 3, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. And you can imagine how troubled their hearts were. This is the very night that he was about to be separated from them. The next day he was already being crucified and in Joseph's tomb. So he says, let not your hearts be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus wants us to be with him. That's the goal that he had just as he left this earth. And that's the goal that we have as we think about our Christian journey. In order for us to spend eternity with Jesus, when he does come again, there are certain requirements that we have in order to be able to go with him. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, we are told, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In order to be there, we need to be like Jesus. Our characters need to reflect him. Right now, during our time of probation, we have the opportunity to develop that type of character. So when he comes again, we shall be like him, and then he can take us with him so that we can be with God throughout all eternity. Now, in order to be like him, we read in the next verse, 1 John 3, verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Those of us who have that hope to spend eternity with Jesus, that our characters may reflect him perfectly. We need to take this opportunity of probationary time and purify ourselves to the same extent as Jesus was pure. Now, to what extent are we talking about this purification? Is it just a little bit or is it complete purification? You know the verse in Matthew 5 and verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. To be purified to the same extent as Christ was pure means that we are to be perfect. Perfection of Christian character is required for those who will be ready at the second coming of Jesus Christ. For this reason, because that is a preparation that we must have, I'd like to read from Fundamentals of Christian Education, page 49. The youth should be learners for the next world. 
and especially talk to the young people because as people get older, their characters tend to become more fixed. It's a little bit more difficult to change our direction in life after we've been setting them in a certain way for many years. And oftentimes, God wants to speak to the young people. Those who are in their youth have an easier chance of making those changes. The youth should be learners for the next world. Perseverance and acquisition of knowledge controlled by a fear and love of God will give them an increased power for good in this life. And those who have made the most of their privileges to reach the highest attainment here will take these valuable acquisitions with them in the future life. Not only is it for our character preparation, but what we develop in our character today is going to take us throughout all eternity. It's not just for when Jesus comes, but for all eternal ages, we are going to take that character with us there. They have sought and obtained that which is imperishable. The capability to appreciate the glories that I have not seen or ear heard will be proportionate to the attainments reached in the cultivation of the faculties in this life. Can you imagine that? The capabilities to appreciate the better world is determined by our character preparation here. Yes, what we do here is preparation for eternity. You see, the kingdom of God is not communism. I remember someone told me one time that, that communism is perfect Christianity. In reality, communism has no semblance of Christianity whatsoever. They tell me, oh, no matter what someone does, no matter what they achieve in life, everyone gets the same. Well, it's not so. In heaven, when we get to the other side, what we develop in our characters here, we will be able to take with us there. Because here it says to be, let me read it one more time, the capability to appreciate the glories that I have not seen nor ear heard will be proportionate to the attainment reached in the cultivation of the faculties in this life. Since we are preparing for that eternal world, what should we be doing? Signs of the Times, February 18th, 1903. Fathers and mothers, whether you are in your home or elsewhere, it is never right for you to speak one disrespectful word to each other. If you are harassed, say firmly to yourself, this is from Satan. He wants me to echo his words, to communicate his spirit, but this I will not do. Determine to speak in love, to cultivate patience, kindness, long-suffering, courtesy, and delicacy in dealing with one another. Why? Because you are Christians, because you are preparing for the society of the heavenly angels, for a home in the kingdom of glory, where no harsh, unkind, impatient words are ever spoken. We are preparing for a better world. We are preparing to be members of the society of heaven. Remember that it is Satan who prompts men and women to speak unkindly. Sanctify your talents of speech. Words are a precious gift, capable of doing much good, of accomplishing a great work for the Master. Every thought, every word is recorded in the books of heaven. Guard well your thoughts and words, that in the judgment you may not be ashamed to meet the record. Yes, everything that we do, we need to think about it in light of eternity. Now, what makes heaven the most desirable place to be? What is it that makes it such a place? John 14, verse 3, we read it earlier. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What ha makes heaven the most wonderful place is the fact that Jesus is there. Jesus wants to spend eternity with us. Do you want to spend eternity with him? Review and Herald, October 19th, 1897. Not only to the disciples, but to us are these words of comfort spoken. In the last scenes of this earth's history, war will rage. There will be pestilence, plague, and famines. The waters of the deep will overflow their boundaries. Property and life will be destroyed by fire and flood. We should be preparing for the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for them that love Him. There is a rest from earth's conflict. Where is it? That where I am, there ye may be also. 
Heaven is where Christ is. Heaven would not be heaven to those who love Christ if he were not there. Are we individually forming characters that will be meet for the society of Christ and the heavenly angels? If we love Jesus Christ, heaven would not be heaven without him. And so we, if we love Jesus so much, we will be preparing for that society, preparing to be fit to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Now, how do we form the right character for that society? How is it possible for us to be like Jesus? We read there that we shall see him, for we shall be like him. That's what we read earlier in 1 John chapter 3. How do we become like Jesus? The verse in 2 Corinthians 3.18 explains it. That we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. We are changed into the image when we behold Him as if we are looking at Him in the mirror. In Volume 5, Testing for the Church, it says every association we form, however limited, exerts some influence upon us. Whether we're talking about associations of Jesus Christ or of Christians or of worldly people, Every association that we form actually has an influence upon us. This is why we need to be careful what kind of people we choose for our friends. Every association we form, however limited, exerts some influence upon us. The extent to which we yield to that influence will be determined by the degree of intimacy, the constancy of the intercourse, and our love and veneration for the one with whom we associate. Thus, by acquaintance and association with Christ, we may become like Him, the one faultless example. Our friends all exert some influence upon us. The amount of influence they actually exert upon us determines how much time we spend with them, how much influence they have in our life by our thoughts as we're thinking about them. So what happens if we're thinking about Jesus Christ all the time? What happens if we're studying about His life and character? What happens if all of our thoughts, we have Jesus living with us in a moment-by-moment -moment actions? What would happen then? We would be just like Jesus. Now, why is it so important to know Jesus to that extent? Why is it so important to really know Him? In John chapter 17 and verse 13, the prayer of Christ for His disciples just before Calvary, He says, And this is life eternal, that they might know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ. Now, these verses tell us that eternal life is knowing God. But is it possible to know God to the fullest extent? Is that possible? Is it possible to know Him completely? We read in Job chapter 11 and verse 7 through 9, Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. You think that we can search into God and find Him out unto perfection? That's an impossibility. In Romans chapter 11, verses 33 to 36, Apostle Paul says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. What does unsearchable mean? Unsearchable means that we cannot find it out unto perfection. For who had known the mind of the Lord, or who had been his counselor, or who had first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. We cannot find out God unto perfection. In Testament for the Church, Volume 8, page 285 to 286, Men cannot by searching find out God. Let none seek with presumptuous hand to lift the veil that conceals his glory. Unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. It is a proof of his mercy that there is the hiding of his power. For to lift the veil that conceals the divine presence is death. If we lift that veil and see God, it means death. No mortal mind 
can penetrate the secrecy in which the Mighty One dwells and works. Only that which He sees fit to reveal can we comprehend of Him. So it is important to know God, but we can only know Him to the extent that He sees fit to reveal to us. Reason must acknowledge an authority superior to itself. Heart and intellect must bow to the great I Am. Yes, we can know God only to the extent that He reveals Himself to us. Now, why is it that God's ways are so different than ours? Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and so are my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are much higher than our ways. But at the same time, the verse said, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. If eternal life is knowing God, and God's ways are unsearchable, how can we find out God? How can we have eternal life? Well, for one thing, we can at least know what God has revealed of Himself. We need to know that we will never understand Him unto perfection because He is God and we are created beings. But that which He has revealed of Himself, we can have that. And knowing that is eternal life. There are secret things about our Creator. Deuteronomy 29 verse 29 states, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. The secret things do belong unto the Lord our God. But that which is revealed is revealed so that we can obey Him. You may remember the story in the time that Samuel was a child and Eli, two sons, were killed in the battle of the Philistines. Eli himself died. And then later on, when the Philistines got tired of that ark, they sent it back to the children of Israel. When it came among the Hebrew people, when they saw that ark, they did something. They uncovered the ark. In 1 Samuel 6, verse 19, And he smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people, 50,000 and threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. What did God do? They looked inside the ark, and many of them were killed. Why was that? Bible Commentary, Volume 2, 1011. The spirit of irreverent curiosity still exists among the children of men. Their experience was irreverent curiosity. When we are studying about God, when we want to know God as He is, we don't want to know Him from irreverent curiosity. We want to know Him because this is life eternal, that they may know Thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. The spirit of irreverent curiosity still exists among the children of men. Many are eager to investigate those mysteries which infinite wisdom has seen fit to leave unrevealed. By looking at these statements, we are not saying that we should not study about God. We have to study about God. If we don't study about Him, we will be lost. But we need to understand the distinction between irreverent curiosity. Those things that God has revealed, we need to learn them. We need to study them. But those things that are not revealed, we need to recognize that He is God and we are created beings. For now, let us consider that most popular verse in the Bible in our study of deity. John 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Many of us have read this statement before. We may even have memorized these statements. What do they mean? What does it mean that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son? In the first place, who loved the world? Who is it that loves us? 
It says here, God so loved the world. Uh, who is this God? What are we talking about when we say, God so loved the world? Well, in Greek, the word God here simply means the supreme deity. Do we worship God? Do you worship God? Do you worship one God? Do you worship three gods? Do you worship many gods? What God do you worship? In our understanding of God, we need to understand something about who He is. In Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 10, it says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Whenever you see the words LORD in all capital letters in the Bible, the original was the word Yahweh or Yehovah, depending on the pronunciation. Now, here it says that before me, this Jehovah God, he says, before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. So if we can think of a point in time, here is deity, here is Jehovah. Before him there was no gods, and after him there is no gods. So you cannot have Jehovah God here, and then another real God here come sometime afterwards. That's impossible, because there is no God after him. This God, how many gods are there? This Jehovah God, how many do we worship? In Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. How many? The Lord our God is one Lord. Do you ever think of the word one in a plural sense? Or do you think of one only in a singular sense? sense. Let's evaluate this a little bit. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24, interesting passage, this word one is also used in this verse. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Now, what do we mean by the word one here? Here you have husband and you have a wife and they become what? They become one flesh. It does not mean that when we talk about marriage that you take a man and a woman and you put them into this one compressor and suddenly you squeeze them and suddenly one being walks out. No. They are still two individuals. But being two individuals, they are still called here in the Bible one flesh. In Deuteronomy, when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, that one is the same term one as speaking for husband and wife. In Numbers chapter 13, verse 23. Now remember the children of Israel, they were at the border of the promised land. They sent some spies out. And the spies went out and they came back with a grape cluster on their shoulders between two men. In Numbers 13, it says this way, And they came unto the brook Eshkol and cut down from thence a branch with one cluster of grapes. And they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. So here you find that this one cluster of grapes, made up of many grapes, is one cluster. This one is the same term one used in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Furthermore, when we think about the prayer of Christ, when Jesus was praying for the disciples, in John 17 and verse 21, he says that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now here is a prayer for the church of Jesus Christ. In this prayer, we find that the church is composed of many members. We may have several people in the congregation. You may have 10, 20, 30 people in a congregation. And what is the prayer for that congregation? That they may be what? One. Now, there may be 30 people, but they still should be one. So when we're talking about the word one, sometimes 
the word one means a singular unit of a plural number of individuals. In Bible Training School, February 1st, 1906, the most convincing argument we can give to the world of Christ's mission is to be found in perfect unity. That is the most convincing proof that we can give of Jesus Christ. If we as a church are not united, then we are telling another type of sermon to the world. The most convincing argument we can give to the world of Christ's mission is to be found in perfect unity. Such oneness as exists between the Father and the Son is to be manifest among all who believe the truth. Those who are thus united in implicit obedience to the Word of God will be filled with power. So we find here that that oneness that is existing between the Father and the Son, that oneness in the deity is to exist in the church. When we become one, it doesn't mean we become one being. We're still individuals. We have our individual characteristics. But we have one purpose. And that oneness is the same oneness that exists between the Father and the Son. Therefore, is our God that we worship God in a singular sense or a plural sense? Let's go back to that verse we just read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. So here, Yahweh or Jehovah is one God. Oh, let's take a look at the word God. The word God in Hebrew is the word Elohim. And it's interesting. The word Elohim is plural. God, when you read it throughout the Old Testament, except in a few exceptions, the term God is in the plural sense, not in the singular sense. So, here, the word God is plural, Elohim. The singular term is Eloah. Job uses Eloah a few times in some other passages. But the majority of the Old Testament scriptures, the word God is always in the plural sense. For this reason, when we look at the creation experience in Genesis 1 verse 26, and God said, who is this? And Elohim, plural form, and Elohim said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. I used to wonder why is it that God says, if it's only singular, why does he say let us make man after our image? Someone told me once, well, let us make man means that God used several uh, entities. Yes, but it says, let us make man after our image. That means that the deity has plural image. After our likeness. But I thought God was a spirit. In John 4 verse 24, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What do we mean that God is a spirit? Is this some impersonal, intangible being? So many times as we read the Bible, we are influenced by our surroundings. Sometimes we get a picture of a cartoon character, Casper the Ghost. And we think that somehow God is the same as this ghost when it says spirit. But no, let's look at the Bible statements. If we are made in the image of God, then God has an image. Let's go back to Genesis 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man after our image. That means God has an image. After our likeness. That means God has a likeness. Well, you make testing for the church, page 263. God is a spirit, yet he is a personal being, for man was made in his image. 
God is a spirit, but God is a personal being. Otherwise, he, we could not have been made in his image. What does it mean, spirit? When we think about angels, are angels spirits? Or are they personal beings? We know they're personal beings. Hebrews 1 verse 13 and 14 though, but to which of the angels said he at any time, sit on my right hand until I make the enemies thy footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? The angels are ministering spirits. And yet they have a being, a tangible being. We are made in the likeness of God. We are made in His image. But Jesus Christ is a little bit different than us. Hebrews 1, 1 to 3. God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He had appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. We find here that Jesus is the express image of the Father. We are all made in the image of God, but Jesus is the express image. The word express image means exact copy or exact representation. The word person means a concrete essence, a person or a substance. We are made in the image of God, but here Christ is the express image of the Father. So when Christ came into this world, He reproduced the Father exactly. He was an exact representation. In volume 7, Bible Commentary, page 921, He, speaking of Christ, represented God not as an essence that pervaded nature, but as a God who has a personality. God is not just some essence floating around in nature. God has a personality, and that's who Jesus came to represent. Christ was the express image of His Father's person. And He came to our world to restore in man God's moral image. Why did He come? He came to restore that moral image of God in mankind. In order that man, although fallen, might through obedience to God's commandments become instant with a divine image and character, adorned with the beauty of the divine loveliness. For this reason, when Jesus was here in this world, the disciples wanted to know more about God. They said to him to show them the Father. In John 14, verses 7 through 11, if ye had known me, ye should have known my Father also, and from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. How can Jesus say, well, you know my Father and you've seen him? Jesus is not the Father. But nonetheless, Jesus was an exact representation of the Father. And that's why he could say, from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Verse 8, Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father and it sufficeth us. Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? If we see Jesus, we see the Father. Why? Because in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says that he is the express image of his person. Verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the work's sake. So here we find that Jesus Christ was that exact representation of the Father to the world. So now that brings us to the next point. Is Jesus eternal God? He is the express image. We can see that when we speak about God, we are, we are talking about the plurality of the Godhead. 
Is Jesus eternal? Is Jesus equal with the Father? We'll leave these questions for our next study. I have returned to the bed of my mother. I learned that Most godlike man a child could know. I just heard a shout from the angels in glory, praising the Lord. A child has come home. I have returned.